This is the AMCP podcast series powered by Pop Health Week. Welcome, everyone. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media, the producer co host of the show. Joining me in the virtual studio is my partner, colleague, and co host, Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health LLC. On today's show, our guests are Patrick Gleason, PharmD, Assistant Vice President for Health Outcomes, and Nick Freelander, PharmD, Clinical Programs Pharmacist, also in the Health Outcomes Division. Prime Therapeutics is an innovative pharmacy benefits manager, or PBM, that launched in 1998, formed by two Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. And with that brief top line, Fred, over to you. Thanks so much, Greg. And Pat and Nick, welcome to Pop Health Week. Hello, Fred. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to get you both on. And uh, why don't we start, Pat, give us a little bit of your background, and then we'll go to Nick. Great. Uh, pharmacist by training, uh, health services researcher as well. Uh, current title at Prime Therapeutics, my employer is Assistant Vice President of Health Outcomes, been at Prime for just under 20 years. I'm also an adjunct professor uh, in the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. It's a pleasure to be here and talking about digital therapies with you, Fred. Fantastic. And over to you, Nick. Thanks, Fred. Um, I am a current clinical programs pharmacist on Pat Gleason's health outcomes team here at Prime. Relatively new employee, I completed the pharmacy residency program at Prime Therapeutics and started on with Pat's team immediately thereafter. I'm a proud graduate of the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy and happy to be here to discuss digital therapeutics today. Yeah, that's fantastic. We've had the, uh, I believe he's the current president of the University of Wisconsin, Governor Tommy Thompson, on before. So it's great to get another representative from the University of Wisconsin. So why don't we start first, Pat? Give us a little background into Prime Therapeutics. Yes, thanks, Fred. Uh, Prime Therapeutics uh, is a pharmacy benefit manager. That's uh, PBM in the limbo. Um, so Prime uh, started uh, 1995 uh, by Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, a few of them. Uh, currently, uh, we're partnering and owned by 19 nonprofit uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the U.S. as our owner clients. Uh, I will say that this unique ownership structure makes it possible for us to remain absolutely committed to the health of our members that we serve. Prime Therapeutics as a PBM serves over 33 million Americans. Uh, and then with our relationship with our health plans, and we're servicing employer groups and their employees and family members, our government programs, including Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, we believe in health benefits landscape founded on fairness and focused on outcomes. And with our 19 Blue Cross Blue Shield plan owners, uh, we're providing total drug management by integrating drug uh, services across both the medical and pharmacy benefits. And more recently, uh, looking into and helping to assess the value of uh, and determination of the clinical uh, offerings that are provided by digital therapeutics in the marketplace. That's fantastic, Pat. So why don't we get into this a little bit, this whole issue of digital therapeutics. Perhaps let's start with what the heck are digital therapeutics? Uh, so digital therapeutics are generally software applications um, that you can download, say, on your phone. Um, they're, they're out there to help with the patient, the individual, we call those uh, insured members uh, when we're a pharmacy benefit manager providing services and, and coverage for things like digital therapeutics. For, uh, in the case of insurance, uh, they may sometimes be paid for by insurance. So these um, applications are generally helping the patient and the provider, the physician, nurse practitioner with the management of the given disease. Uh, Examples of digital therapeutics out there are to help with diabetes management, including uh, monitoring what foods you take, intake, and the caloric intake of, of given foods, uh, your exercise program, your blood sugars, any other any symptoms of, of low or high blood sugar, uh, providing support with given weight management, exercise, food caloric intake, and glucose monitoring. That's your blood sugar. That would be an example of a digital therapeutic that would help with those, those service offerings and maybe even providing coaching as well. So digital therapeutics around the gamut of many conditions just help with many, many conditions. They may also help with the drug therapy that is associated, drug therapy management associated with those conditions. Digital therapeutics uh, also uh, have a varying degree of their ability to interact with and provide to a given 
uh, healthcare professional information about the given the, the, the condition being managed. So some of them are really for the, the individual patient only. Uh, others are connected to the provider and ultimately can information can flow into the electronic health record or electronic medical record that is being maintained by your your physician and provider. So that there's a there are many there are literally thousands of digital therapeutics. I will say that there are very few though, only six that are FDA approved as prescription digital therapeutics, meaning that they are intended to be written for as a prescription from the prescriber, the provider, healthcare professional that has prescriptive authority uh, to be given to the patient to then be submitted for insurance coverage and and then that given. Um, coverage paid for by your insurer provides access to open up that digital therapeutic application. And so there is a difference uh, between that prescription digital therapeutic and other digital therapeutics on the market that we may want to explore. I'll toss it over to Nick for further. I'm sure I missed some things here. Nick, do you have further thoughts? Yeah, Pat, that was excellent, really robust background on digital therapeutics as a whole. I guess what I would add here is that there is a very important distinction between kind of digital health products and digital therapeutics specifically, because digital health products really run the gambit in anything from wearables like uh, Fitbits or Apple Watches uh, to telehealth applications and medication adherence applications. Digital therapeutics really more specifically are intended to have a direct impact on clinical outcomes that can be measured. And this is kind of the idea behind needing research and trials to support the value of these products and why some of them can be approved. It's because they have a demonstrable effect on uh, clinical outcomes. And that's something that I think insurers are interested in seeing and um, something that sets apart some of these FDA reviewed products uh, necessarily make specific health claims. So I would just add that really there are tens of thousands of digital health products. And then within that, there are thousands of digital therapeutics and then a much smaller subsection that have kind of evidence to support them and have undergone FDA review. Yeah, I think it's a really good point that you, that you brought that out because we've talked about it before on the show, Greg and I and others, this whole issue. Everybody out there has got an app. They're all building these apps. But, but as you point out, very few of them have data to back up what they do or claim to do. And even fewer have enough of the data to, I guess, meet that FDA approval. And so those are areas that you as a PBM are beginning to say, maybe we should begin to integrate some of these into our therapeutic uh, offerings for patients within our drug plans. Yeah, I respond positively to a yes to that, Fred. <laughs> um, and, and we do that through what historically has been, we use the term formulator review and with a prescription and therapeutics committee assessment. That's a body of external healthcare professionals, physicians, pharmacists generally. And it's a pretty um, standardized process. Uh, it goes back many years to assess generally pharmaceuticals um, and that what they call P&T, that physi- ph- uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committee uh, is presented usually with information summarized by, in this case, prime therapeutics, uh, team of, of healthcare professional pharmacists, uh, experts in data, in, in medical data review, uh, and economic assessment of the value that a given product may bring to the marketplace, assessing the impacts on outcomes, uh, hospitalizations, uh, other events avoided, uh, hopefully by that given product. Uh, as well as assessment of safety, and then the uniqueness in the delivery uh, convenience factor that a given product or pharmaceutical may have. So in those three areas, the PNT is presented with information and then makes and provides guidance as to whether or not the insurer should cover uh, that product and pay for it uh, through the insurance. Um, so using that pathway of review, uh, we're, we're looking to bring the yeah, assessment process and rigor to the digital therapeutic space, in particular to the prescription digital therapeutics that are FDA approved. Um, and right now there are six of those. Uh, 
in the in the areas of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Uh, there's one. It's it's actually a game um, to help manage ADHD. Yeah, it's like a, a, a handheld video game. Irritable bowel disease. So that's uh, really um, painful and upset stomach, and we, it, it's just chronic and, and ongoing. Um, so irritable bowel syndrome, insomnia, chronic insomnia, or you know, sleep difficult sleeping. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is really what the application is. Uh, it's 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 coaching and training and helping control symptoms and 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 train you to uh, avoid triggers and, and and address issues with trying to sleep, um, and including a, a fourth prescription tools therapeutic is for cognitive behavioral therapy and substance abuse disorder a fifth is in specific to opioid abuse disorder and lastly a post-traumatic syndrome or ptsd uh, driven traumatic nightmare uh, digital therapeutic so those six are unique in the marketplace in that they have uh, prescription fda approval for their given products so before we get into the products you're using, um, can you talk about, I'm thinking about having sat on a P&T committee, going through that process for a pharmaceutical, are there differences when you go through that process for a digital therapeutic? I'm thinking things like adverse events or stuff like that. Are they similar, the same, or do you look at it slightly differently? Yeah, Fred, I think that's a really great question. I think really at its core, the process is fundamentally similar. We still want to see safety and efficacy. Admittedly, with something like a digital therapeutic, the risk for adverse effects that are serious is obviously much lower than with a drug. Um, It's difficult to really anticipate serious adverse effects associated with interaction with uh, a screen or video Um, At this point, there really isn't evidence to support that. And I think the FDA takes that into consideration when they're evaluating the evidence around these. And the obvious uh, difference that we see is much smaller, less robust clinical trials um, supporting their approval. With that said, um, I I think we still want to see a demonstration of efficacy. We also ideally want to see real-world evidence supporting benefit of the product um, in populations outside of the clinical trial and users of the actual application uh, in practice. And I think the the one really unique consideration around the digital therapeutics when it comes to evaluating them is around the security of data. And this is not an assurance that's given by an FD, by the FDA when they approve an application. Um, they're simply looking at efficacy and safety data at this point. So really, I think it's important to have assurances around the data handling abilities of the manufacturer in question and have those conversations with the manufacturer to ensure that they're protecting member data and member privacy, particularly in some of those sensitive health conditions that Pat mentioned that there are digital therapeutics currently approved for. I, I think, Nick, that you raise a fascinating point I hadn't thought of, which, which is the yeah, FDA is going to approve that because it showed that in patients with these conditions, we saw these better outcomes, et cetera, but they don't do anything in regards to the security. So do you specifically have to develop sort of the questionnaire or approaches to ensure that what they're doing meets those security requirements? I think that is a really essential element of the conversations that we have with manufacturers when we're considering the addition of these products. I think we also have to look at the history of the company as far as um, how long their products have been around, if they've had issues raised with data security in the past. I think that this is a very new and novel space, so it is difficult to have those assurances from kind of any regulatory body at this point, but there are um, bodies that do offer accreditations in this area that can be looked at. Um, But I will say that I think that it it is really key to have those conversations when determining whether these are suitable for addition. And it's not really something that we can um, externally uh, evaluate without kind of buy-in from the manufacturer and the ability to um, get information around their data security and um, data privacy handling concerns. So, you know, I'm thinking about past PT, P&T committees, and I never recall having an IT expert on the committee. Have you had to bring in that kind of expertise, or uh, how are you looking at that? Yeah, uh, Fred, that, that will be a component 
uh, that will be necessary? So the answer is yes. Wow, fascinating. I mean, that's a, a unique thing to consider, obviously, as, as we move into this space. And as others consider di- digital ter- digital therapeutics is bringing in that kind of expertise to a committee that's typically been very clinically and data driven. So fascinating. Yeah. Fred, one thing I guess I would add um, in, in addition to kind of that data security element is the usability concerns around these mm-hmm. as well. Um, familiarity of the population it, that you have membership in, uh, whether they're you know, used to using phone applications, if they have kind of that same familiarity with them that the clinical trial population had. So I think usability, um, accessibility, the need for high-speed internet, typically a wireless high-speed internet connection and Wi-Fi in the home is really preferable to any other option. Um, The need for a smartphone in the case of the application for PTSD, it also actually requires additional hardware that the member would be expected to have on their own. So these are some additional factors with them that maybe aren't uh, don't reach the same uh, level of evaluation uh, needed uh, that security does, but certainly something that we've thought through around these applications and kind of some barriers to access uh, for them that are unique. Right. And obviously you mentioned earlier, we'll kind of diverge here a little bit, this, you know, your plans take Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, you know, the, and other, other groups. Are, are you concerned? I know there's a lot of concern now with the digital divide that perhaps we, we further that by bringing these types of apps in that then require, you know, uh, an internet connection, which certain populations may not have access to. And is it something you're considering looking at how you might rectify that in the future? I I think that's a really very realistic concern. I will point out that one thing that's sort of interesting is recent census data really suggests that the internet accessibility issue is, you know, becoming less and less severe as we move forward as far as rural access and low income access. There are still obvious limitations in both of those populations, but the majority of individuals making less than $30,000 Um, And the majority of people in rural communities uh, from most recent census data actually do have high speed Internet access and Wi-Fi. So I think that, you know, that's certainly a consideration. And hopefully in the future, this will continue to be less and less of an issue. But I do find it interesting that, um, you know, smartphone access, Internet access and things are becoming more and more ubiquitous regardless of income and um, where somebody lives in terms of rural or urban communities. Right. And obviously it's part of the infrastructure bill. So we'll see if that gets through to put a, I think a hundred billion dollars communities, which would be great to give them access. And interesting, I noted when I was looking through the press release, and let's get to your, um, the products that you've actually brought on board. Uh, Pat, perhaps you'd like to discuss uh, what those are and, and why you chose to use them. Yeah, sure, Fred. I, I do want to touch on, if I could, just, uh, the, the health disparity issue you just mentioned. I'll be happy to talk about the products in a moment, but I, I would like to add that you know there is concern that uh, these some of these products uh, you know are meant to be cognitive behavioral training, and they're in English, and we have many native, not non-native English night uh, speakers. So we, when we do asking. The, uh, the manufacturers, uh, at a minimum, they include Spanish as a, as a language and as many other languages as possible uh, so that we, are, we don't create these health disparities that we know exist as well. Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a great point. I'm glad to hear you're doing that. I know that in some of the programs the states would require, depending on their populations, you had to produce your materials in up to five you know, mm-hmm. languages. Uh, one of the programs we worked on, we ended up with people who spoke 65 different primary languages. Obviously, getting to that point is really difficult, but at least focusing on those major ones is great. And it's, I'm glad to hear you're pushing the manufacturers to do that. Right. Yeah. So, um, and then to address your, the question you uh, just pointed to me. Uh, so right now, um, our focus is on the prescription digital therapies on marketplace to review and, and, and do a deep dive into and provide guidance and, and recommendation to our blues plan. So it's, it's the blues plans ultimately that make the insurance decision, decision coverage. Um, so it, when our, our review is provided to them, um, we started with uh, the paratherapeutics product, uh, Reset O for cognitive behavioral therapy and opioid dependence. Um, 
and providing a recommendation to cover that product, uh, as well as we have uh, a value-based purchasing agreement with that manufacturer that's a part of the press release. And that ensures that this, this given product has a list price of $1,665 uh, for an 84-day service um, with the application. Uh, that it's uh, that there is value to the product, and when individuals um, may discontinue, may not continue to use that application after a period of time, uh, prior to that 84 days from which the clinical trial data showed there was benefit in uh, patients staying actively engaged with their providers uh, on their substance abuse and opioid abuse um, treatment uh, program. Uh, that was the value that the product delivered, and we. Need, we felt we needed to uh, ensure that we received some remuneration if an individual were to discontinue early use of the application. We also have contracted terms around uh, that there is a total cost of care reduction, that there's an event avoidance, uh, that the uh, provider is actually the, the prescriber and the, the, the caregiver here in terms of the healthcare professional is is accessing that data too because what is unique about these prescription digital therapeutics is that there is a communication of the the patient's activities and use of the application to the to the healthcare professional um, so that that is a differentiator from other digital therapeutics in the marketplace those that are prescription de- uh, therapeutics have that data transfer availability portal information for the healthcare professional to ensure that they're having a conversation with their their patient about use of the digital therapeutic. I would also add, Pat, that one really unique thing around the digital therapeutic is kind of with the exception of some of these ingestible sensor technologies that we're also seeing in the digital health space, we never really know whether or not a member is actively using their therapy in a lot of cases. And a lot of that can be attributed to automatic pharmacy refill programs, 90-day supplies. It's really difficult to track Um, whether members are actively engaging and using their therapy, um, particularly those that are dispensed from a pharmacy. And the digital therapeutics are really unique in the ability to really actively track engagement with the application, kind of see how much members are utilizing it and really track if there is a drop off after a period of time, if members aren't using it, we're able to have the visibility into that that wouldn't be possible in areas outside of the kind of digital space. Mm-hmm. And Nick, the you know these are for um, substance use disorders and opioid abuse disorders. The the two apps you're using, what do you believe they bring in a, in addition to what you would have in normal therapy? How do you expect this to work? Sure, I, I guess from the clinical trial perspective, what they really demonstrated was a statistically significant increase in retention and outpatient treatment relative to a control group that did not use this application in addition to kind of their baseline outpatient uh, care for substance use disorder. So really the expectation is that that is a surrogate outcome measure for long-term success in rehabilitation. And what we would expect to see I guess is like Pat mentioned, r- reductions in the cost of care and reductions in uh, hospitalizations and ER visits, um, basically improvements in overall health um, that would be akin to improvements in rehabilitation long term. So the way that I envision this working is really as it's indicated as a supplement to everything else that's given as part of comprehensive outpatient treatment for substance use disorder. So in addition to in-person therapy, members are able to access these cognitive behavioral therapy modules that can reinforce some of those things that are learned through those in-person sessions, maybe touch on specific issues that are not addressed in those sessions that are relevant to the member. Um, They have a large number of optional modules that members could be able to select independently that might be beneficial to them uniquely. So that flexibility to have focused cognitive behavioral therapy in areas that are relevant to them. It also is really essential that it has that provider integration. And so it's able to share information around 
cravings, triggers, and other things that might be of relevance to the provider in kind of determining if maybe there needs to be an adjustment to therapy to increase their likelihood of long-term success, um, or maybe changes to their in-person therapy. Um, so it really providing that enhanced visibility to the provider around what's going on with the member who's in recovery. So I really envision it as sort of this additional digital support system for individuals who are struggling with substance use disorder and who are amenable to um, using this digital app as a means of receiving cognitive behavioral therapy and um, providing information to their physicians as well. Well, that's that's a great answer there, Nick. Really appreciate you getting into it in that depth. I think we're going to have to get you both back on and maybe hear about how this worked in the future, as well as to discuss other areas in digi digital therapeutics that you might be looking into or excited about. So with that, Pat and Nick, I'd like to thank you both for joining us on Pop Health Week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. And back to you, Greg. And thank you, Fred. That is the last word for today's broadcast. I want to thank Drs. Patrick Gleason, Assistant Vice President for Health Outcomes, and Nick Freelander, Clinical Programs Pharmacist in the Health Outcomes Division at Prime Therapeutics, for their time today. For more information on Prime Therapeutics, go to www.primetherapeutics.com and do follow them on Twitter via at Prime Therapeutics. For the AMCP podcast series powered by Pop Health Week, my co-host Fred Goldstein and Drs. Gleason and Freelander. This is Greg Masters encouraging you to follow and subscribe to this series at www.amcp.org forward slash podcast. 